wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman mazida amma ba'd First and foremost we must thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his countless blessings benefits and bounties upon all of us and the greatest of these bounties is the ni'ma of al islam is the ni'ma of guidance to the truth and the ni'ma of the guidance of purification and if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then none of us would be sitting here today wa qalu alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadi lawla an hadana Allah from the dua of the people of paradise when they enter paradise Allah azza wa jalla says to them udkhulu enter enter into this beautiful wonderful place from the very first things that they will say those people's faces were like the moon such bright vibrance in their faces they will say all praises are for Allah who has guided us to this and if it wasn't for Allah's guidance then we wouldn't be able to do this so we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance walaw sha if Allah will la hadakum ajma'in Allah will have guided all of you but Allah guides those who he wills those who he chooses and selects and secondly we thank uh, the imam of the masjid Sheikh Adil brother Ahmed Kendal or Kendid brother Adam brother Saad brother Altif and the rest of their brothers and sisters who played a part in organizing uh, this meeting in such a short notice and alhamdulillah for doing such a good job and last but not least I would like to thank all of you brothers and sisters for your personal dhun thinking good of me and thinking the best of me and perhaps you've heard some things from brother Ahmed which were we say perhaps he said out of happiness things that he really didn't mean, things that he really didn't intend. He was so happy, so such a joy to see, you know, he moved that he said some things that were inappropriate, things that are not true about me, not from humility, but things that are incorrect. And we are only but beginning students of knowledge. People who just begin to pierce that bottomless, endless ocean and sea of the end. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us better, to increase us in beneficial knowledge and in righteous action. And brothers and sisters in Islam, we go on for a very, very long time uh, speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon us all. The ni'am. And we read in the Quran. Before we start with what we want to speak about tonight, and we ask the question: what is the greatest sin in Islam? What's the greatest sin, the worst thing that a person can do as a Muslim? Or anybody, the worst sin is what? Shirk billah. To make shirk with Allah, to associate partners with Allah as a Jaqayyim. What is the longest verse in the Quran? Ayat to date, the verse of what? Of debt, of loaning. It's the longest verse in the Quran. The greatest sin is shirk. Yet still, the longest verse in the Quran is what? Something that's not talking about shirk. But what is the longest series of ayat? Not one verse talking about a great sin in the Quran. And we find one place in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about one thing in so many verses. All in one place. What is that sin? Is it shirk? Repeat the question. A sin in this land. Something that's impermissible, that's wrong to do. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in so much detail in one place. The most uh, verses that you'll find in one place together speaking about a sin and a crime in this land as well. Not lying. Something that pertains to lying, but not directly lying. Something more specific. Allah subhanahu speaks about one sin. Not, not riba. <laughs> close, not close enough. <laughs> not salah, not. Yeah, not nifaq. Longer. 19 consecutive 
the verses. Sing my own Quran. Father, I know you know the answer. Stealing. Nah, not stealing. It's a benefit. Nah, not in that. No. Contract. It's a surah that was revealed in the Medini period. It was revealed in Medina from the first 30 surahs of the Quran. It's a surah in the first 30, first, first 30 surahs of the Quran. Allah speaks about one crime in so many verses. That, not Nifat. Longer than Nifat. Closer than Zina, not divorce. Divorce is not a crime. Divorce is not haram. <laughs> the hadith that says, Abu Halali al Allah al Talaq, the most hated, permissible thing to Allah is divorce, is a hadith which is totally inauthentic. And the Prophet never said that. The Rasul did not say the most hated halal to Allah is divorce. There's no halal that Allah hates. There's no halal that is a very famous hadith. Munkar. It's rejected hadith. It's one sin that Allah speaks about in detail. Haram. It's haram, but it speaks about it in so much in one place. In that, that, we gotta put on our thinking kufis. Kufis in the masjid, right? Masjid prayer cat. Is it breaking a relationship with your? That, inshallah, we give a couple more minutes before we have to go on to our election. <laughs> <laughs> that, Allah says, Allah says, Verily, those who eat the wealth of the orphans unjustly only fill their bellies with fire, and they shall enter a blaze. Riba? Not Riba. Namima. That <laughs> that we try. That huh, that that sin is what? It's accusing heedless, chaste believing women of being unchaste. That is the longest place where you find consecutive verses speaking about censuring of one sin. And that is from the beginning of Surah An Nur. <laughs> The 25th chapter, Allah speaks 24. about it in detail. 24. Tayyip? 24. 25th? 24th chapter. What did we say? 25th. Tayyip. 24th chapter. Hey, how about this? is good. This will come back. Alhamdulillah. Tayyip, now. Allah says in Surah an nur He speaks about Khadf al Mursanat. Those women who are chaste, those women who are unaware, they don't know what the word Zinat means. The word fornication and adultery is not in their vocabulary. And the Munafiqeen, they slandered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife, our mother Aisha, <coughs> Allah sent you the Sahaba. And it's one specific thing that Allah said to the companions, which is the point that we're trying to get to, the highlighting point. And that is, Allah says, if it wasn't for Allah's bounty and Allah's virtue, مَا زَكَى مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ أَبَدًا Allah he says, if it wasn't for Allah's bounty upon you, none of you would be purified. None of you would be cleansed. None of you would have zakat. But Allah he purifies those whom he wills. And Allah is all hearing, all knowing. The point that we're trying to get from this is what? If it wasn't for Allah's grace upon us, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't have the ability to come to the masjid on Yom al Jumu'ah to cleanse ourselves of our sins. The filth of kufr and shirk, the filth of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These things, when they get upon a person's heart, as Imam Ibn al Qayyim rahim wa ta'ala mentioned, they cause rust. Just as metal is, becomes rusty, the heart becomes rusty. So we have to realize, brothers and sisters, how many of us, before we walk through this match tonight, actually thought about this. If Allah had willed, I would have been in disbelief. That's scary. If Allah had willed, I would have been from those who don't know the masjid and don't come to the masjid. We need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those favors. Khayr, inshallah. The topic of tonight's talk, in brief, I won't hold you too long, inshallah. Not too long. This is going to be something left, not too much. <laughs> is pertaining to what the Prophet says in several authentic hadith. 
بُعِثْتُ بِجَوَانِعِ الْكَلِمِ He says, Allah has sent me with comprehensive total words. Allah Azza has sent me as a messenger with speech that is brief, that is short and wordy, but it needs volumes. It's profound. And it can be explained in depth. He says, Allah has sent me with Jawami al Kalim. The Prophet's words that were collective, that were comprehensive, are of two types. Two types. The first of the two is the Quran. Is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah he says in the Quran an example of this in Allah Ya'murukum bil Adli wal Ihsani wa Ta'i bil Qurba wa Yana al Fahshai wal Munkari wal Baghi. Ya'idukum la'alakum tadakkarun. Allah says in Surah An Nahl, the 16th chapter, He says what? <laughs> Indeed Allah commands you bil Adl to be just. Allah orders you to be just and to be fair. While ihsan, and that you are benevolent and kind. And that you give to people who are relatives, you give to people who are close to you. And Allah forgives, forbids you from what? And Allah forbids you from fahsha, from anything which is repugnant. And it's an incorrect translation to say that fahsha means zina. Fahsha is kullu ma fahusha wa tala an had al ma'ruf. Fahsha is anything that is extreme, that's unbearable. Murder is considered fahsha. Disrespecting one's parents is considered fahsha. Arrogance and pride is considered to be a fahsha. And similarly, a zina is considered to be a fahsha. Allah forbids you from anything which is illicit and anything which is repugnant. Allah forgives you from munka, from that which is bad and evil, a vice, a scourge. Allah forgives you from it. He forbids you from these things. And aggression. Allah forbids you from transgressing the boundaries. The great Tabi'i, the great scholar of Al Islam, Al Hassan al Basri, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said, Inna hadihi al ayah. لم تترك خيرا إلا أمرت به ولا تترك شرا إلا نهت عنه. He says this verse didn't leave anything which is good and wholesome except that it commanded you to do it, and it didn't leave anything which was evil, which was a vice, except that it told you to stay away from it. But it's only one verse in the Quran, one short brief sentence. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتأيد القربة. Allah commands you. With adl, to be just, to be benevolent, and to give to your family members. Hasan al Basri says, This verse has told you to do all good. There's no doubt that that verse is comprehensive. That's a, that's a collective statement. Allah commands you to be just. Be just with Allah. Be just with yourself. Be just with Allah's slaves. That's the entire team. Be just. Worship Allah. Don't disobey Him. Be just with your family members. Protect them, feed them, provide for them. Be just with yourself. Don't oppress yourself. Don't look at haram. Don't eat from haram. Don't intake haram. The word justice is in the entirety. So this is the first half of the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The comprehensive, collective speech that Allah sent him with. The second part of his comprehensive and collective speech is the sunnah. Is the ahadith of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A clear example of this is the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said kullu muskilin khamrun wa kullu muskilin haram The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says every intoxicant is considered to be khamr Anything that intoxicates you is called khamr Anything that causes you to lose your mind and impairs your vision and your judgment is called what? It's called khamr, not just wine, not just alcoholic beverages, anything that changes the way you think and feel and understand, it's called khamr. And that's because al khamr ma khamr al aql. Khamr, you see a resemblance in the word, is similar to another word in Arabic. What word is it similar to? Khamr. Kullu ma khamr al aql. Kullu ma ghat al aql. The word khimar, a woman wears one of her what? Her arms, her chest, where does the woman wear her khimar? 
on her head. The khimar does what? Cover. It covers her head. So the khamar is like a khimar, it covers your mind. You can't see. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. You don't know what's right, you don't know what's wrong. So the Prophet said, anything that is an intoxicant is considered a what? Khamar. This statement was said by the Prophet 1400 years ago, and it can remain until the day of judgment. No matter what drug, medicine, pill, drink, something you snort, something you inject, does it intoxicate you? Then it's called what? So therefore it's impermissible. There lies no doubt to anyone who has a sensible mind, that's a comprehensive speech. Everything that intoxicates you, you have to stay away from. Allah Akbar. In America, in Saudi Arabia, in the desert, in the jungle, anything that intoxicates you does what? It is called what? Khamr. And Allah Azza wa has forbade the Muslims from Khamr. So a non-Muslim may say Islam is only for the Arabs. Islam was only for a specific time, a specific region. It's 2013, it's technology, it's different things. The Sharia is bayyaka. We say no. Anything that intoxicates is considered khamr. And any khamr is what? Haram. This is a clear example of the comprehensive speech of the Prophet The Messenger of Allah he says, La taqdab. Do not become angry. Many people, they go to shrinks, whatever you call them, psychiatrists. They go to, they read books, they study science <coughs> of how to live peacefully, how to control your evil feelings, and so on and so forth. The Prophet suddenly summarized them, everything in one sentence. Don't become angry. Don't lose your temper. Don't let go of yourself. Don't fall into your aggressive feelings. How many books are there written on philosophy and Eastern thought? And which they explain these things in detail. We can name the, 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 the titles of these books. They study these books in universities and scholars and philosophy. The Prophet suddenly said one line. Don't become angry. Don't follow your desires. Don't oppress people. Don't be arrogant. Don't be haughty. Don't become angry. That comes from me. Adina Nasiha. The religion is Nasiha. It's sincerity. It's purity. With Allah, with yourself, with your slaves. And we can go on and on and on. Showing what? The Prophet was sent with Jawani Rudd Kalim. He was sent with the comprehensive collective speech. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have selected, or well, I have selected for myself firstly, and for my brothers and sisters for Al Islam, one of these comprehensive ahadith. A famous hadith, a well known hadith to every single Muslim that deserves to be explained and reflected upon and, and thought about constantly. And this hadith is a famous hadith of Rasulullah that is collected by a man Muslim in the beginning of his book, Kitab Al Iman, the book of Iman. The hadith of Sufyan ibn Abdullah al Thaqafi, in which he went to the Messenger of Allah. And he said, قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسْأَلُ عَنْهُ أَعَدًا غَيْرًا He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please tell me something. Give me some advice. Give me a word or a statement that I won't have to ask anyone else besides you. Tell me something that is what? Comprehensive. Tell me something that is collective. Give me one piece of advice that will suffice me. And I won't have to ask anyone else besides you. The Messenger of Allah he said to this great companion, Qul amantu billahi mustaqim. He said to him, Say, I believe in Allah, and then be upright and steadfast. Tell me one statement about the entire religion of Al Islam. Something I can hold fast to, something I can cling and clutch to. He says, Say, pronounce, speak out, Amantu billah. I believe in Allah. And after you make that statement, be upright and be steadfast. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked by the companion, Inna Shirai Islam Aliyah, he says, There's so many rules of Islam, so many things from the Sharia. There are a lot. So give me one piece of advice, something simple and something comprehensive. He says, La yazalu lisanuka ratban He says, Make sure that your tongue is always moist with Allah's victory. Make sure that your what? Your tongue is always moist with Allah's dhikr. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to reflect on this hadith and to see what some of the scholars of the past said and what this hadith means. It's a totally authentic hadith in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded Sufyan ibn Abdullah with how many things? With two things. The first thing he ordered him to do was to say that he is a believer. 
say I'm a Muslim, say that I believe in Allah. And then after you make that statement, that's not enough. That's insufficient to just say that you're a believer. But he says, Thum mustaqim. Then be steadfast and be upright. You said that you're a believer, so let your actions prove that you're truly a believer. One of the great scholars of Islam, Imam Ibn Rajab, who died in the year 795 of the Hijra, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says, وَالِسْتِقَامَةُ هِيَ سُلُوكِ السِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ وَهُوَ الدِّينُ الْقَوِيمُ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَعْلِيجٍ عَنْهُ يَمْنَةً وَلَا يَسْرًا وَيَشْمَلُ ذَلِكَ فِي الْطَعَاتِ كُلَّهَا الظَّاهِرَةَ وَالْبَاطِنَةَ وَالتَّرْكِ الْمَنْهِيَاتِ كُلَّهَا كَذَلِكَ فَصَارَتْ هَذِهِ الْمُسِيَّةُ جَامِعَةً لِخِصَارِ الدِّينِ كُلِّهَا Ibn Rajab Rahimahullah Ta'ala he says the term istiqama, being steadfast, being upright. He says it is treading the straight path. Be mustaqeem. Every single prayer that we make, we say a statement. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us to the path of istiqama. He says that istiqama is treading the straight path, which is the religion that is straight. Not to the right, not to the left. There is no extremism in the religion. And there is no negligence and nonchalantness in the religion. You don't go overboard in the deen and burden yourself and do things that are beyond your ability. Nor do you neglect Allah's sharia. You don't do it's right in the middle. He says, and this includes performing all acts of obedience. Everything that you can mention that is an act of obedience, such as what? An act of obedience such as what? Salah. 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 Such as? Salah. So fasting, such as what? Zakat, other acts of obedience. Birul Walidain, respecting your parents, Hajj, what else? Many, many acts of obedience. Huh? That's it. Adin is just a few things. Personal God, having good thought to your brother. What else? There are many, many other things. What about dua? Praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What about khawf, fear of Allah? Khashya, Rabba, Rabba, the acts of the heart. Most Muslims, most of us, when we think about ibadah, we think about a term that's doing something physical. But the foundation of your ibadah is the ibadah of the heart. And from the heart springs the acts of the members. So when the Prophet said to him, Thum mustaqim, say, I'm a believer in Allah, and then have istiqama. In other words, the name and terms he told him what? What did he say to him? Say that I'm a believer, and then do what? If I will, he says, do all acts of obedience. Those that are obligatory, those that are recommended, those that are outward, those that are inward, when you're ill, when you're healthy, when you're traveling, when you're at home, perform any good that you have the ability to perform. And this clearly shows how this hadith is what? It's jamia, it's comprehensive. Perform everything that is ta'a, that is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, those which are outward, and those which are inward. What tarqil men he yet and leaving off things that the Prophet ﷺ and first Allah Azza has forbade you from. Let's make an example. What is the definition of the term makruh? When we say something is makruh, if we translate it, it means dislike. What does that mean? What is the meaning of the term makruh? A term that many Muslims use on a daily basis. You say, I think you shouldn't smoke cigarettes. He says, smoking cigarettes is makruh. It's just disliked. What is meant by the term Makru is a very, very important issue. Makru does mean it's not haram. It's not haram. Mulha. Tayyip. Is wajib haram? Is something that's obligatory? Is that haram? No. So that can't be the definition of Makru. Mustahab, they say be haram. Mubah, they say be haram. All of these things are not haram. So that's not a clear definition of Makru. Al Mani An. Al Wajib. Mani An. Al Haram. Nuhi An. So hey, that's not enough. It's something specific, makro. Something specific. When we say something is haram or something is makro, then they both share a general circle. And that circle is both of these acts or statements or drinks or foods or types of clothing. They have been what? Maybe you're gonna something hurt not haram, but it's not appreciated. Something that's not haram, but it's not appreciated. It's a good definition, but it's too broad. 
because the, the wajib is included in that. It's not haram and you should do it. It's a smaller circle. The Prophet ﷺ forbids you from doing something. He forbids you from doing something. Wait. When he forbids you from doing the thing, it could be that it's haram, or it could be that it is what? Makru, it's disliked. Tayyip, something could be haram, or something could be disliked. So therefore the term haram, and the term makru, they both share a general something meaning. That has no benefit. Ma nuhiya anhu. Something that is prohibited in Islam. However, then there's a difference that comes later on. Is that the haram, the prohibition of the haram is what? It's a serious prohibition. A serious prohibition. And the makru prohibition is slight. It's best not to do this. You shouldn't do this. But it's not a sin. But it's not a sin. No. But both of them things have been what? They have been what? Prohibited. The Prophet says, he forbade you. Don't do this. Don't say this. Sometimes it's obligatory. And sometimes it's what? Sometimes it's what? Sometimes it's obligatory to avoid that act. And sometimes it is recommended to avoid that act. So we say that the makru, manuhi anhu nahyan ghayr jazim. Is that thing that the Prophet ﷺ told you not to do, but not in a very serious manner. So this hadith, thum mustaqim, be steadfast, be upright, does it include disliked acts? Or just talking about statement from the haram? It includes, includes disliked acts. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he did what? He, naha anha. He forbade the people from doing those things. But he didn't, it wasn't stringent. It wasn't a thing that he mentioned a sin for. Or hellfire, or Allah's anger, and he's free from Allah and his Rasul. Don't do an act. Everybody got the point? Is that the term istiqama includes leaving off everything which is prohibited. Everything, whether it's haram or whether it's disliked. Whether you must leave it off or whether it is best to leave it off. It's a very important benefit that we give from this hadith in our daily lives. And that is if you see a Muslim doing something wrong, you see him doing something which is incorrect. He say, I think you shouldn't do this act. Perhaps he may say, it's not haram, it's just makru. <laughs> is it wise that you argue with him and debate with him whether it's makru or haram? Is that from hikmah? What should you say to him? What should you say to him? That it's best to leave it off. Do you, well, is anyone want to differ that smoking is best to be left off? It's best not to smoke. Sahih? Or is the difference of the pain about this? It's best not to what? It's best not to smoke, without a doubt. It's best not to smoke. So if you go to a person and say, Aki, you shouldn't smoke. The first thing that he's going to say is not haram. You say, I didn't say it was haram. <laughs> but I'm telling you that it's what? It's best not to do it. Even if it is makruh, which is not smoking is haram. But if it is dislike, is your iman going to increase by continuing doing that which is makruh? No. Your man is not going to get higher. Your man is going to gradually go low. And the more of the dislike act that you perform, then you fall into that which is? Huh? Haram. You continually do something which is disliked, disliked, disliked. The dislike act will lead you to its sister. And the sister of Makru is haram. So the point that we're trying to make in this beautiful hadith is that it includes the entire religion. In layman terms, it is as if the Prophet said, It's as if he said to him, Say, I'm a believer, do all good and leave off all bad. Do all good, no matter what that thing may be, and leave off anything which is not best to do. And that's how a slave's iman increases. Ibn Rajab, Rahim Allah he says, فأصل الاستقامة استقامة القلب على التوحيد كما فسر أبو بكر الصديق وغيره قوله إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا لأنهم لم ينتفتوا إلى بيره فما تستقام القلب على معرفة الله وعلى خشيته وإجلاله ومهابته ومحبته وإرادته ورجائه ودعائه والتوكل عليه والإعراض عما سواه استقامت الجوارح كلها على طاعته فإن القلب ملك الأعضاء وهي جنوده فإذا استقام الملك استقامت جنوده ورعاه 
وكذلك فسر قوله عز وجل فأقم وجهك للدين حنيفا بإخلاص القصد لله وإرادته وحده لا شريك له Ibn Rajab says this hadith means the asr of istiqama. A person may ask the question now, what's the virtue of being mustaqeem? What do I need from it in my daily life? Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Allah says, those who say, our Lord is Allah, those who profess that we are Muslims and we are believers, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ they have no fear. Nor any worries. What does this verse mean? They won't have any fear in the future, nor will they have any worries about the past. They won't have any fear about that which awaits them in their hereafter, nor will they have any worries about their family members and the worldly life that they leave behind them. A person, he may be safe. A person could be safe from fear, but it doesn't mean that he doesn't have sadness and worry. A person can have sadness and worry, but he may not be in fear of anything. If something tragic happened in your lifetime, you were in a bad car accident, you became very sick, you became very ill, you were attacked, something like this happened to you, very tragic accident in your life. After you become cured, you become healthy, is it not possible for you to sit on your bed and think about what happened to you? Is it not possible for you to think about how tragic how traumatic that incident was, and that's called worry and grief. That's huzn, sadness. Even though it's no fear, you're not in a car accident anymore. There's no danger of dying anymore. You're not dead. You live, you survive. But you still have what? You still have sadness, you still have worry. Or a person may not have any sadness or any worry, but he's fearing something that's going to come in the future. This is why Allah clearly said, those who say, our Lord is Allah, they have istiqamah, they won't have either of the two. Allah says, the awliya of Allah won't have any khawf, meaning the awliya of Allah, the people who are mustaqeem, who are upon the straight path, they won't have any fear of the grave. They won't have any fear of standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They won't have any fear of the hellfire. They won't have any khawf. Nor do they have any huzn, any sadness. What is so happening with my wife and my children? My, from the people that I left behind when I died, they're not worrying about that. Because Allah has blessed them. And this is from the greatest fruits of istiqamah. <laughs> وَأَبْشُرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ نحن أولياءكم. Allah says, verily those who say our Lord is Allah and then they're steadfast, they have this istiqamah, the angels will descend upon them. And those angels will tell those believers, don't be afraid and have no worries. We are your protectors, we are your helpers and have glad tidings of the Jannah, the paradise that you were promised. This is the reward of istiqamah. So when one knows the fruit of it, he may say, what is istiqamah? And how do I obtain that thing? How do I make sure that I'm mustaqeem? The answer is right here what Ibn Rajab said. He says, the foundation of al istiqamah is the istiqamah of the heart. It's a person's heart being steadfast. It's a person's heart being upright upon the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, in a person's heart being steadfast, he says, whenever a person's heart is steadfast, upon knowing Allah, fearing Allah, respecting and having awe of Allah, loving Allah, intending, hoping, and calling upon Allah, and putting your trust and your reliance upon Allah, and turning away from all besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the limbs will have istiqamah. When the heart is upright, when the heart is firm, then you'll have istiqamah with your tongue, with your hands, with your eyes, and the rest of the good deeds come. As the Prophet said, He says, indeed in the body, there's a lump of flesh. If that lump of flesh is upright, if that lump of flesh knows Allah by His names and His attributes, if that lump of flesh is attached to Allah, then the entire body will be like that. And the opposite is the opposite.
He says, وَأَعْرَضُ مَا يُرَامُ اسْتِقَامَةُ بَعْدَ الْقَلْبِ مِنَ الْجَوَالِحِ الْلِسَانِ فَإِنَّهُ تُرْجُمَانُ الْقَلْبِ وَالْمُعَبِّرُ عَنْهِ وَلِهَذَا لَمَّا أَمَرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِالْإِسْتِقَامَةِ وَصَّاهُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ بِحِفْظِ لِسَانِهِ وفي مسند الإمام أحمد عن أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يستقيم إيمان عبد حتى يستقيم قلبه ولا يستقيم قلبه حتى يستقيم لسانه. He says the greatest thing that a person should pay attention to and to make sure that it's upright and steadfast after your heart is your tongue. It's to make sure that the tongue is upright and steadfast. And that's because the tongue is the translator of the heart. The tongue is the interpreter of the heart. Evil statements only come from an evil heart. And good statements only come from a good, wholesome heart. When a person makes a statement, as they say, there's truth in every joke. There's truth to every joke. A person, he says something about you which is negative. He says, I was just plain then perhaps in his heart there's an amount of negativity about you that he feels about you. And that the tongue, the interpreter, it said what the, what the heart intended for it to say. Even though the heart didn't directly tell it to say it, but he knows that's what the heart feels as a real interpreter. If he takes an Arabic statement, he takes an Arabic statement, and he translates it, or he interprets that statement. The unskilled translator is going to give you a word-for-word -word translation. He's not skilled, but the person who understands both languages, both cultures, he is the one that's going to give you the, the, the interpretation. The equivalent of that parable, that proverb in Arabic, is this and is that. The hadith, when a person says, in that jiza, min jin salama. That a person's reward, if you translated it literally, in that jiza, min jin salama. Oh, come back to deen to them. You say what? You receive as a reward, the reward that you give to people. Like, that sounds okay. That's a translation. But that statement in English we say, what goes around, comes around. That's what that statement means. It's the difference between tarjama, translation, and between tabir, interpretation. So the point that we're trying to make is the skilled interpreter, he understands both cultures, he understands both languages, and he understands what the speaker wants to get across to the listeners. So the tongue, even if you may not intend to say a bad statement about a person, it knows what the heart intends. It knows what's inside of the heart. For you touch him on So therefore, it interprets. It interprets. He says here, this is because the tongue is the interpreter of the heart. And for this reason, the Prophet ﷺ, when he ordered him to be mustaqeem, he commanded him to protect his tongue. And we can sit down and we can speak about the crimes and the sins of the tongue. Kevin, lying, backbiting, swearing, passing on the mima. And the greatest sin of the tongue is making a lie against the law of subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tongue is the thing which will lead people to their graves. And another example of this is what we say loose lips sink ships. Sink ships. <laughs> that if you don't control your tongue and you say anything, it will lead you to fall down. As the Prophet says, in al Abda, they had to kill them and be killing with him in the Quran and Latin. La yuqila habalin. The slave will make a statement without paying too much attention to the statement. From what pleases Allah, and it will lead him to enter paradise. A paradise that is most expensive. Wa in al Abda, they had to kill them and be killing with him in Sukhti Lahi. La yuqila habalin. He says that the slave may make a statement heedlessly, that statement displeases Allah, and it will take him to a fire that's wider than the distance between the east and the west. And the best thing that we can close out with and we can stop with is the famous hadith of those two men from Bani Israel. The two men from the previous nations. One of those two men was a worshiper. He prayed to Allah. He gave charity. He was a pious, righteous man. And the second man was a sinner. He was an evildoer. So whenever the righteous man would see his friend, he would say, Aqsir, Aqsir, Aqsir. He would tell him, stop making sin. Stop disobeying the law. Stop doing these evil deeds. Every time he saw him. So one time when he saw him, he told him to stop. 
And the man, he became angry. And he became upset. And he says, He says, is it your only job to look what I do? Have, has Allah sent you to be my protector and my watcher? Go away from me. So the righteous man, the religious man, out of his jealousy for Allah, out of his concern for Allah's deen, he says, Wallahi la yaghfir Allahu laq. He says, I swear Allah will never forgive you for making a statement like that. How can you say that? Allah will never forgive you. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took the souls of those two men. And he resurrected them, he resurrected their souls, he took their souls. And he asked the righteous man, the pious man, who prayed at night, who fasted in the daytime, who gave the charity. He says, Man that the yata'alla aliyya. Who is the one that can swear and can assure that I won't forgive this slave and that slave? Who is the one that can say that? Who is the one that can tell me who I can and cannot forgive? He told that righteous man, take him to the fire. He says, He says, I've forgiven you to the sinner. And he told the righteous man, I've written your deeds null and void. I've written your deeds null and void, and he was righteous and pious. And the other man was an evil sinner. But his tongue, he didn't have istiqam, he wasn't balanced in what he said, and Allah Azza wa took him to account. In the Allah Azza wa Jalla, there are several things that we'd like to share, and like to mention, with regards to this hadith, or with regards to other hadith and other issues, there's not enough time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be of those who have istiqam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to allow us to be of those who understand the sunnah of the Prophet and who implement it and who act, it, act upon it to the best of their ability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. I thank you all once again for your participation, for your attentive listening, and your awareness, and for your participation in the class. And I'm sure you can forgive me if the lecture was too long or too lengthy at a late time. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala abdi wa rasulihi nabi Muhammad. جزاكم الله خيرا. إن شاء الله. I don't think we're gonna let Brother Mufti off the hook. So we're gonna open up for questions and answers. In شاء الله. We have him here from Medina. We're not gonna let him go that easy. So in شاء الله. Open up the floodgates. Ask all the questions you want. This is your opportunity. In شاء الله. We have a you know scholar amongst us. In شاء الله. So please take advantage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive Brother Ahmed for all of his mistakes. I mean, everybody say I mean. May Allah forgive him all of his shortcomings. Perhaps he has a lot of wisdom done for me. We ask Allah Azza to make us from this means of knowledge. To make us of those who seek the end of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam haqqan, truthfully, and not just in the sand with the tongue. Alhamdulillah, we have no questions. That's good. Your question. Follow. As Allah uh, had a perfect Arabic and English speaker. Allah uh, Muhammad. How? Where do you advise uh, our our native English speakers to seek uh, like proper knowledge, right? And religious knowledge. Okay. I'm not talking about people that will go to the college at least. Sources for, for lectures and people that you should Every listen day, to. Every so, day, here in America. Exactly. Right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Our brother asked a question for native uh, speakers or people that are born and grow up in this country. What do you advise them to do for regards to benefiting and for regards to learning? Seeking Arabic and so on and so forth. We say that firstly, seeking knowledge of the deen is from if not the greatest thing that a slave can do, from the greatest acts of worship, is to seek ilm of the deen. As Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, speaking to his last slave, his last messenger and prophet, Allah says, worship your Lord until yaqeen comes to you. Worship your Lord until death comes to you. And we know that worship is only based off of ilm. Without knowledge, you don't know how to worship, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has explained to us in the authentic hadith that is collected in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu, wa Allah, man yuridillahu khayran, 
يفقهوا في الدين وانما انا قاسم والله يعطي او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام whatever Allah wishes good for he gives him fiqh of the religion the slave that Allah wants good for he gives him understanding of the deen and I am nothing but a person who passes out and who disperses and distributes what Allah actually gives this is the second part of the hadith it's very important it's not quoted too often Allah is the one who gives all I do is just hand out what Allah gives so this hadith we can understand from it مفهوم المخالفة an opposite understanding is that the one who does not have fiqh the deen the one who doesn't have an understanding of the religion Allah did not want good for him Allah did not want good for the person who has no understanding of the deen and as the Prophet has explained to us in the hadith الذي ليس في جوفه شيء من القرآن كالبيت الخلق the one who has nothing from the Quran the one who hasn't memorized any of the Qur'an is like an empty, abandoned house. No good in him. He's an empty shell. So therefore, seeking the end of the deen is something that we constantly need a reminder of. So we say, seeking the end of the deen, alhamdulillah, has been explained in detail by the scholars of the past and by the scholars of present day. They have told us what to do, what not to do. How, when, who to take knowledge from and who not to take knowledge from. We say knowledge is to be taken from the people who have knowledge. Knowledge is taken from one who possesses knowledge, as the Arabs say, Faqidu Shaykh Layyati. The one who doesn't have can't give. The one who doesn't have can't give. The boy can't give. The blind cannot lead. So therefore, we say that knowledge, the awesome of knowledge, is that it's taken from the people whom Allah Azizah has given that knowledge. Whether that person is a scholar, an alim, haqqan, a true scholar, not just a linguistical term, someone who's learning, someone who has a PhD in the field or a science, they call him a scholar, someone who's a true alim. Whether that person is a student, whether that person is a moderate student, an advanced student, or whether someone like myself who's a beginner and in the beginning stages of seeking it. We say that knowledge should be taken from the teacher. And many of the people of the past, they said, Man kana, shaykhu, kitabu, kana khatahu akthar min sawabi. The one whose scholar is his book will make more mistakes. The one whose teacher is his own book, he will make more mistakes. So we say, step one. Or point one is that you should find a teacher. Someone whose religion you respect, whose religion you trust, who has some type of piety of Allah Azza wa Jal, who has the correct belief in Allah, the correct practice of the Sunnah, He's not upon sin, upon innovation. He has some type of ilm, some type of qualification that you should take from him. You should sit with him. This is one step. Another step, we can say, is to take from the authentic literature or the authentic and the correct websites because there are many websites and there's countless literature, but all literature and all websites are not correct. Rather, do we, do we realize, brothers and sisters, that there are non-Muslims, non-Muslims, whether they, whatever their religion is, who make Islamic websites to mislead Muslims. They make websites, give them names, they make websites so Muslims can go to them and become misled. So therefore the person is to be careful. The person has to be careful whom he takes his religion from. So therefore if it's a person who has some type of it, it doesn't have to be the most knowledgeable person, he has something to offer you. He's upon that which is correct, not perfect, not an angel from the sky, but he's upon, inshallah, that which is correct, and you should learn from him. The literature that's authentic, that is clear, that's not mixed. The websites that call you to Allah and His Rasul, and not the websites that call you to this person and that person and this group and this organization. As Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, "Qul hadi sabili adru ila Allah, ana wa man tabani, wa Subhanallahi wa ma ala busiratin, ana wa man tabani, wa Subhanallah wa ma ala min al-mushrikin." Allah says. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is my path. I call to Allah upon basira, upon ilm, upon knowledge, not upon ignorance. I do this and those who follow me. This verse is a scholar of Islam who said, He says, in this verse, 
Allah brings to our attention that we have to be sincere. Because many people, when they call you to Allah, when they want to teach you something, in reality, they're only calling you to themselves. They're only calling you to be part of my group and my organization. Whether they give it this term, or that term, whatever the case may be. Whatever term, whatever they give it. But they're only calling to a person or group. So we say, the person who seems to be sincere, the website that quotes from Allah, from His Rasul, from the ijma, the consensus, from what the companions said, from what the tabi'een, the salaf of salaf, the pious predecessors said, then inshallah you take from that website. Inshallah you take from that book. And there's nothing that's perfect besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalla man la yasu, as they say. How perfect is the one who never forgets. Some people, they make mistakes and they make errors. But the person who has the intention to do that which is correct. The person who has the theory that this is correct. He may fall short in practice, but the theory is one thing. This is one aspect. I would say, I would advise the Muslims to take advantage of the technology, the internet, iPhones, iPads, Samsung, Galaxy, whatever you want to call it. There's so many things that Allah Azzawajal has given us. And I can say this briefly, as that Alhamdulillah, in my short life, I'm young, but when I first started seeking knowledge, I can remember there were no iPads. In the city of Philadelphia, if you wanted a book in Arabic, you had to order from California. There was no Riwaya market in this website. There was none of that. There were no iPads, no iPhones. There were not all of these major websites that they had. If you wanted an Arabic book, you had to order online. If you wanted to learn Arabic, you had to go and hunt and seek it. Nowadays, some years later, everything is in Arabic. They have a thousand free apps in Arabic. This book, this website, this, you can, it's no excuse not to learn it. So the point that I'm trying to get to is that we should utilize and take advantage of what Allah Azawajal has made for us. He's made the technology for our use, not for the use of the Kufar. قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ Allah. Who is the one who makes it impermissible? Allah's adornment. وَالْقَيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الْرِزْقِ And the good provision. قُلْ Here Allah says, say, the provisions for who? The kafirin? لَا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا خَالِسَةٍ Allah says, those who believe. So I would advise the student, the learner, to take advantage of the, of the lectures, of the books, the PDFs, the search engines, the things that he can take advantage of. And many people, I don't want to be too lengthy in the answer, but it's important. Many people, they think, I can only learn when I go overseas. I can only learn when I go to an Arab country. I can only learn in the Middle East. I can say, my limited knowledge, alhamdulillah, this is countless information that I learned, and I benefited right in the United States. And when I got to Medina, when I went overseas, Alhamdulillah, we benefited from what we learned. You can learn wherever you are. You can learn wherever you are. So the believer, he should start off with that which is simple, that which is easy, and that which is clear. No complications, no technical issues, no khilaf. If a person wants to study a book on fiqh, then he should study a book that has one opinion in it. That's it. No two opinions, no three opinions. No, this hadith is like one simple basic opinion. Learn it, understand it, perfect it, and move on to the next level. And tajweed, a person who starts with a simple basic mental on tajweed, the basic rulings of tajweed, perfect his tajweed, and then move on to the bigger books. Arabic, what happened to that? You should stay consistent on one thing. The Prophet has explained to us, Ahabwa la amali ila Allahi adwamuhu. When qalla, the most beloved action to Allah, or acts to Allah, are those that are most consistent, even if they're few. Mm. The, the acts that Allah loves the most, not the greatest actions, those actions that you do the most consistently, even if it's a small piece. So every day, try to memorize the verse from the Quran. Every day, instead of sitting down talking about somebody, or talking about sports, or politics, and this leader, and this player, and this person, learn a dua. <coughs> learn dhikr, learn the verse of the Quran, learn ahkam noon uh, al sakira. Take you five minutes to learn the rules of ah uh, noon al sakira. What are ahkam Ahmed? That's right. We say ahkam al noon al sakira in the Quran. When there's a letter noon and has a sukun upon it, how many rulings pertain to that? It's a basic lesson in tajweed. How many? Come on. Somebody start me off. Ha? Fadl. Four. Five. Mahia. What are the fours? 
على الاخفاء على الادغام ها ادغام طيب يسال على الاخفاء ولا استوي مور تنوين لا احكام الدون الساكن على الاخفاء على الادغام والاخير the point I'm trying to get to takes you five minutes to learn that. There are four rulings of a noon that has a sukun in the Quran. Ikhfa, 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 so on so forth. It takes you five seconds to learn one thing. Then the next day you learn, Ahkam, Mim, Sakina. Then the third day, Wahakana, you build and you base. And before you know it, after a week, two weeks, a month, you have a solid piece of ilm. To dubbush, piece by piece, step by step. I'll leave you and answer this question with one story. The story of a man of the past, perhaps he was in the city of Baghdad. When he went to the different circles of hadith, he would sit in the circles. He would listen to the scholars of hadith, but he didn't understand. He didn't memorize. Time will go by, time will go by. He didn't see himself achieving anything. So he says, khalas, hadith is not for me. He quit. He stopped seeking hadith. So as he walked away from the, from the masjid, he passed by a boulder. He saw a big rock. And he noticed on top of the rock, there was water that was dripping on top of the rock. And he noticed that there was a dent in the top of the rock with the water. And in that dent, there was a small little pool of water. So he stopped, and he thought, and he saw each small drop of water, and he saw that solid rock. And he says, that water is soft and it's easy. It made a dent in that solid rock. He says, knowledge is heavier than water, and my heart is not as hard as this rock. So he went back, he saw it from the beginning in the proper steps, and he became from the famous scholars of Hadith. So most important thing is that we do things systematically. One book here, one book there, one class there, one that. Systematically. Method for method. Dots for dots. You make review. This is an issue which can be explained, and which needs to be explained in a lecture in itself, as we mentioned in the last message. When they asked about how to memorize the Quran, we can explain that in a series of lectures. Inshallah, this is beneficial. Bein Allah Azza wa Jalla, ma la yudrahu kullu, la yudrahu jullu. As the Arabs say, the thing that you can't do all of, you should do some of. If you can't do 100%, then at least do 65. Wallahu a'lam. Fadl. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Look at this. Thinking too hard. Mufti, I wanted to ask a question. About arm and class. Uh, for laymen. For laymen, what is the rule? Is are they restricted? That are restricted? And those things that are general, are they general? And if they are, how for a layman like me to know when? Clear. Question says I'm and khas. Which a person could translate to mean general and specific. Rough translation. Yani, in other words, these things pertain to the science called usul al-fiqh. The science of legal theory. The science of what? Legal. Of legal theory. Now, let's make something, let's make an easy way of understanding legal theory. In America, what is the source of law? Judicial system. The Constitution and the, what else? Judicial system. Judicial system. Why oh, that's said Constitution. That's the source of law. So, hey. Yeah. That's the source of law, of legislation, the Constitution. Wait, who is the person that goes into the Constitution and the amendments and the rules and the ordinances? Who is the person that looks into those things? Who is the person? What is he called? Judge. <laughs> Judge or a lawyer, prosecutor out of him? A lawyer, let's keep it general, a lawyer. A lawyer or a judge. They're the people that read the Constitution, read the laws, read the ordinances, the amendments. So, hey? Yeah. What do they do with the Constitution? They use it, right? This rule says this, so therefore, this is okay to do that in this state. This Constitution says the right to bear arms, so therefore, we have to get gun licenses, so on and so forth. They use the Constitution. There's three pieces. There's the source of law, the one who uses that source, and the manner of using that source. Source, the user, and the way of using it. Everybody got these three pieces? Yeah. It's the source of legislation. The 
the one who uses, goes back to that source, and the, the way and the manner that he uses that source. These are three tiers. This is what the surah fiqh is in Islam. There's a source of legislation. The Qur'an, the Sunnah, the Ijma, the Qiyas, Shara man qablana, al ihtiyab Sadd al Buray, Al-Musad al Mursala, il akhirihi You have sources of legislation. Tayyip, who is the one that uses the Qur'an and those hadith and those statements? The layman and Muslim? Or the faqih? The faqih. The faqih in this instance is the lawyer. How does he use what Allah says? Don't do this, do that. The tariqah, that is called what? Usul al-fiqh. Usul al-fiqh. How to extract the ruling from the general text, not the specific text. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, uh, the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, he says what? وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ From the rights of the wife upon the husband, is that the husband should not slander and curse at his wife. The man should not say things that are repulsive to his wife. We say this is a specific ruling. That it's haram to say bad things to your wife. It's haram. That's specific. How do we know that it's haram? Did the Prophet say that it's haram? Did he say it's haram to revile your wife? Did he say that? He said what? La tuqabbih. Usul al fiqh is using that, that, that term la to prove that anything that comes after the statement la is what? It's one of two things. It's one of two things. Who paid attention from the lesson? Anything that comes after the word la is one of two things, which are? It's something that's either impermissible or disliked. So that is usul al fiqh. Using the general tools to reach a specific ruling. The specific ruling is the impermissibility of cursing at your wife. The way of reaching that ruling is that the Prophet said, La, don't do kebba. Don't say this, don't say that. So, usul al fiqh, without a doubt, is for someone who's skilled. It's someone who understands the Arabic language, someone who understands the text, someone who has memorized a good portion of the Quran, a good portion of the Sunnah, someone who knows the different ulum and the funun. For the general 9 to 5 Muslim, we say there are some things that you can't understand and there are many things that are going to be confusing and extremely technical. That are going to be confusing and what? Extremely technical. And the Arabs, what do they say? After Qosa, Bariha. They say give the, the bow to the one who shoots it. Give the bow to the archer. Give the bow to the one who uses the bow. Someone who can shoot, not to anyone. Meaning what? Is that usul al-fiqh is a technical science. In general, it's something that is used by the students of knowledge and by the fuqaha. But there are certain things that a Muslim can understand from usul al-fiqh. That the Prophet sallallahu says, Kullu muskilin khamr. Wa kullu khamrin haram. The Prophet sallallahu says, Kullu, every intoxicant is considered to be khamr. And every type of khamr is what? Haram. Haram. I'm a 9 to 5 Muslim. I'm a layman Muslim. I don't understand too much. But I know that the term kullu means sigh al The term kullu is a term that proves generality. What's the rule on taking NyQuil? What's the rule on smoking marijuana or drinking alcohol? I'm not a faqih. I don't have it in me. But I know it causes intoxication. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, kullu. Every intoxicant is khamr. The Prophet says, Man jaa min jumaata falikhtasim. Whoever goes to the Jum'ah prayer should take a bath. A person may say, he may have an argument with his wife. She says, I don't have to make a ghusl. I shouldn't make a ghusl. Just the men make the ghusl. Because the men there are obliged to go to the Jum'ah, not the women. The husband, he will say, What? La, you should make a ghusl. Why is that? Because the Prophet Sallallahu says, whoever goes to Jum'ah should wash. And that term men includes men, women, old, young, knowledgeable, ignorant. This is an example of how a general person can have some basic understanding of a surah al The hadith says anyone who goes to Jum'ah should wash. So the term anyone includes everybody. Are you back to the point? 
Now, is it obligatory? Is it recommended? Can we get that from the hadith? That's something that you need for the students, the one who's digging into it, the technical issues. But in general, in general, there are some things that you can't understand, and there's some things that will be confusing and they will be technical. Clear? There's a book uh, by a scholar named uh, Sheikh Sa uh, Sa'ad al Shifni, who's from the scholars of Riyadh. He has a book about the principles and the basic rules of Usul al Fiqh or Qawaii Fiqhiya for the general nine of five Muslims. It's a very good book. We ask Allah Azza to make it easy for someone to translate the book into the English language. I mean, Allah Azza wa knows best. Tafadol. Yeah. Actually, I want to go with the second one. Tafadol. Uh, <laughs> this area in the Quran when it says, إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتاب موقوفا. طيب. Because we were talking about the translation. كتاب موقوفا. It's clear in Arabic language. طيب. How can we apply this in our daily life? For example, صلاة الفجر 6:45. Okay. We can move it to six. Maybe six five. Some people move it to six thirty. Quadre. So out of quadre. Clear. Right. Okay. The question says, Allah mentions in the Quran, Nisa, that establish the prayer. For indeed, the prayer is Kitaban Mokuta. Kanat al Mubinida, Kitaban Mokuta. It is Kitab and it's Mokut. These two terms, he says, are clear in the Arabic language. Yani Mafrudatan fil Uqat al Muhaddada. The prayer, kitaban, yani hatman. Hatman is obligatory. Mawkutan, muakadatan fil awqat, al muhaddada shalman. Those prayers are two things. They are obligatory and they are obligatory in certain times. How do we understand this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fajr and the other prayers? Some people they say pray at the beginning of the time. Some people they say pray at the end of the time, in the middle of the time. We say, to summarize it, not to go on too long, the hustle, the rule of thumb for the salah is it's best to be made at the beginning of the time. Uluman, in general. In general, it's best to make prayer as early as you can, in general. Point two, or step two, the prayer is best, it's more beloved to Allah to be made in congregation, in jama'ah. Point three, the congregational prayer is based upon masalih al musallim. It's based upon the ahwal, the conditions, what's good and bad for the people that come to the masjid. The jama'ah prayer is not based off of what's convenient for the imam. It's not based off of what it says on the prayer schedule. The jama'ah prayer is based off of what is convenient and easiest for those who come to the masjid. في أول الوقت في آخر الوقت في وسط الوقت. The beginning, the middle, or the end of the time. المهم مراعاة أحوال الحضور. It's looking after the conditions of those who come to the masjid. So, if it's easy for people to pray at six or five, they should pray at six or five. If it's easy for them to pray at six thirty, they should pray at six thirty as long as the time doesn't go out. And the last point that we say is that there are specific rulings to every prayer. Specific rulings to every prayer. We said in general, prayer should be made when? Early. As early as possible. That's in general. However, every prayer has a different ruling. Salat al Fajr. What is it best to make Salat al Fajr? Let's open up the floodgates. When is it best to make Salat al Fajr? Early or late? Late. It says late. Anyone else? Ah. Before the sunrise. Before, before the sunrise. Early. Tayyip. Some say early, some say late. Tayyip. Some say early, some say late. We say in brief, there are hadith on both sides. There are hadith that prove that it's best to pray Fajr as early as possible. And from those hadith is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu And what she said, the believing women would leave the masjid, they would go to their homes and they couldn't see their sisters. They wouldn't know who was sitting next to them. Minan Ghalas, because it was so dark outside. That the believing women, they covered themselves 
Huh? He says, Bimurukihinna. They covered themselves, and when they left the masjid, they couldn't see, or they couldn't distinguish Sister Fulana from Sister Alana. They saw a body, Shilwa, Silwa, right? There's one hadith. Then there's another hadith that states, Asmiru bin Fajri, Faynu a'adamu bin Ajr. The hadith of Rafi ibn Khadij, radiallahu anhu. Hadith from Sahih. Which the Prophet says, Pray the Fajr as light as possible. Aspiru. Aspiru. Khalil asla. Aspiru. Hey, when it's suffer, when it becomes light. Because it's greater for your reward. Contradiction. We say it's a long issue amongst the ulama. It's a long issue. If it's best for the believers to pray early, then let them pray early. If it's best for them to pray a little late, then let them pray a little late. Tayyip, Salatul Muhammad, what is the best to pray? It can come out sometimes. Early is not. Except for if it's extremely hot outside or extremely cold. Salatul Asma, best to pray? Early as possible, according to the Jamu'ah, most scholars. Salatul Maghrib, earliest. It's not from the Sunnah to delay the prayer. As Rafi ibn Khadija radiallahu anhu said, Kunna nusallin salat al-Maghrib from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fayansarifu ahaduna wa indahu la yubsiru mawaqi'a nablihi We would pray Maghrib with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when we left the masjid, we would be able to see where an arrow would land. It was, it was light, it wasn't pitch black dark as many Muslims do. I tell you, many Muslims, they think the Maghrib has to be pitch black dark. Now the khapa is a mistake. Now, as the catalyst, Salat al Isha, early or late? Late. Early or late? Early. Late. Early or late? Early. 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 What's the proof? What's the proof? What's the delay that's best to make it early? Early. Or if you make it late. <laughs> What's the proof that it's best to make Isha late? Right hand in the class from the etiquette of the dogs, alhamdulillah, is that you always raise your right hand. Never raise your left hand, always your right hand. Follow. Make it late after Isha, no talk. <laughs> What's the deal that it's best to make Salah from Isha late? Question clear. What's the proof that it's best to make Isha at a late time? Follow. What is the specific proof that it's best to make Isha late? Follow. What is the hadith? That's what we want. Abu Bakr Siddiq and uh, Omar Abu Abu Bakr Siddiq was going to do it early because he wasn't uh, sure, he wasn't worried to, to, to miss uh, uh, before Salat uh, and the other one was so sure that he can wake up so he can do person may say I'm not convinced too vague, too general the proof is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that is collected in the Sahih, that one day or one night the Messenger of Allah he delayed the Salah. He delayed the Salah to a very late part of the night. And he says, He says, indeed, this is the proper time for Isha. But I fear to make a hardship upon the Muslims. What did he say? He says, indeed, this is the right time to make Isha, the best time. No lab and ashuk, but I don't want to make a hardship upon my ummah. So we say the best time to make Salat for Isha is late as possible. However, in the Jama'ah, Salat al Fajr, the Masjid, work, person has to go home, sleep, they should look after the ahwal, what the people are upon. What did the process in the If he saw that they came to the Masjid, ajal. He would make the salat in the earliest time. What if he saw that they came late? He would wait and allow them to come to the masjid. So we say here that it's detailed. Sometimes it's best to make prayer early, and sometimes it's best to make the prayer later. None of this you can understand unless you have the basic head. Man, you need to be khayran, you fucking with the deen.
what Allah was good for, He gives him fiqh of the religion. What's the greatest act of worship in Islam after Tawheed and Iman is what? Salah. The greatest thing to perform after Iman is Salah. You can't do the Salah perfectly unless you have Unless you have Follow Jamal. I think the best opinion from the Rock going mosque. Uh, to pray Aisha at 8.15. <laughs> 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 uh, the best thing for the rock going last year at 8.15. Yeah. In the winter. In the winter time. Is that a hadith? What is the hadith for all? Follow Muslim. Salam. What? Like, example of something besides sacred stuff. The question says, what is another example of something being necrol besides smoking cigarettes. We say firstly, smoking cigarettes without a doubt is necrol. It's disliked. It's not disliked what people mean. It's disliked by Allah. So it's disliked by Allah. The term necrol means something that's hated. Allah says in the Quran, after he spoke about shirk, after he spoke about disrespecting your parents, after he spoke about zina, after he spoke about being unjust, taking people's wealth, many, many, many sins. He says, Okay, surah. What surah is that in? Ah, la, la, not from the Amen, not from the Amen. Someone beside the Amen. Brother Adam. Surah Al-Isra, Ascent. What chapter? What number is Isra? Quick, quick. Isra 17. Ascent, play. 17, sharp. Allah Azza He says, All of those things are disliked by your Lord. Let's ask the question. Is zina just disliked? Quote unquote. It's haram. It's evil. Is disrespecting your parents just disliked? No. But Allah called it what? He called it what? Makruh. He said that it's what? It's makruh. But it, the Prophet says, If Allah kari halakum falatman. There are three things that Allah dislikes for you. And from them he says, Ida'atul mal. Wa qeel wa khar wa kathar tu suhaat. How can I call He says, wasting money, asking too many questions, and he said, she said. Are those things just dislike? Nah, they're haram. It's prohibited to waste money. So the point I'm trying to get to is that cigarettes are disliked. And they're haram, they're disliked by Allah as well. And cigarettes are disliked by the angels, and they are disliked by the clean, pure human beings. So therefore, cigarettes, the technical meaning of Magru, that's incorrect to say that. Cigarettes are not just disliked, they are haram without a doubt. And there's no Muslim or Catholic. No one has any sense who's going to differ with the fact that cigarettes are considered a vice and a scourge, without a doubt. A waste of money, bad breath, yellow teeth, throat cancer, lung cancer. There's no doubt cigarettes are a bad thing. Cigarettes are a bad thing. So therefore, we say that there are many things that are disliked in Islam but are not haram. Such as what? Who can give us an example? Who wants someone else? A new participant. A new participant. La, nah, you answer on there. We need a new person. Someone from Ashab al Yameen. Atif. Uh, sleeping after praying Salat al Sleeping after Salat al Asr. This light? Tell you. The problem of Fadl. Eating onion or garlic. Eating onion or garlic or coming to the masjid. It's too technical. It could be haram. It could be haram. The Prophet says, La yakrabanna masjidana. Toki, he should not come near our masjid when he eats onion or garlic. That could be haram. We need something clear. Follow that. Drinking, drinking while standing. Play. Take it. Love us. We say drinking while standing. Good example. I said it. Very good. An example that's clear. No difference of opinion. Praying asr at the time. Not according to Abu Hanifa. We want something clear. We want something that's agreed upon. Unclear. We say very simple hadith. 
When the prophet saw him when they was using the bathroom, he was urinating, and someone came to him, and he gave him the salams. The Messenger of Allah did not return the salam until he was finished. And he said to the man, he made an excuse. He says, Inni karihtu an adhkur ismallahi illa ala tahar aw kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Inni karihtu, I dislike to mention Allah's name unless I'm in a pure, clean state. So he said, that's an example of something which is disliked. Some people say standing up while drinking is disliked. Some say it's haram. Some say it's haram. There are many things that are disliked. Uh, anything in which the Prophet ﷺ doesn't praise, doesn't tell you to do, but at the same time he doesn't say that it's a punishment for doing it. Then that thing can be classified as what? As disliked. And we say that the Muslim should not do too many things that are disliked. Because the disliked acts lead to the haram acts. Just as recommended acts, you keep doing recommended acts, it leads you to obligatory acts. Wahakada. Wahakada. So there are many, many things that can be considered to be uh, uh, disliked. Many things. Yeah, I know. Several, several actions. Follow up. You're giving us the middle. Because I'm blind, I can't see. So follow up. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I gave the chicken, uh, uh, I mean the chicken, a roasted chicken to my friend, he told me it's halal. Why? If a uh, lot of Muslim people, they don't eat meat from a uh, supermarket. Why? Uh, it's not halal, but it's not haram. Our brother here he asks with regards to eating meat, slaughtered meat, halal, haram, zabiha, zabiha, and so on and so forth. We say that in general, the Muslim should not ask his brother or sister, is the meat halal? General, you shouldn't do this. The Prophet sallallahu he says, in the authentic hadith collected by a man Muslim, in the Sahih, the hadith of Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, inna a'ram al-Muslimin jurman, man sa'la an shay'in lam yuharram, fa yahrum bi sababi mas'alatihi. The Muslims who have the greatest sin with Allah, or those who ask about things that were not impermissible until they asked about them. Let's make an example of this hadith. Everybody's in the masjid, they eat it, mashallah. And there's roasted chicken. This is delicious. Wow, wow it's really good. Chicken is stuffed with rice. <laughs> and then the brother comes in the masjid and he says, Akhi, is that halal? Or is that Purdue chicken? He says, Well, I eat from Purdue. Everybody who was eating, licking their fingers, and that say, Ah, they, wanna, they may say something bad against them. We were enjoying this meal. No one had any doubts about it until you asked the question. Sahih? No one had any doubts about that chicken until you asked the question. So therefore, it is definitely disliked for a person to ask about some meat from a Muslim. Unless you know that the Muslim doesn't care. That's one thing. That's one thing. As for the issue of the meats, the halal, the zabiha, that's a long, 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 long issue. A very long issue. And we say that Allah has allowed us to eat the slaughtered meats of the Jews and the Christians as long as we do not know that they were killed incorrectly. Whether they were choked or stabbed or shot or shot electrically or the name of other than Allah was mentioned. Allah has made it permissible for the Muslims to eat the food of the Jews and the Christians as long as we don't know something that's opposite to the way that they slaughter. It's a long issue, we don't have the time to speak about it. But in general, that's incorrect. You shouldn't ask. The Muslim brings you something, you say Bismillah. The Muslim brings you some food, you don't know nothing bad about the Muslim, you should say what? Bismillah. You say Bismillah, you should eat. Wallahu a'lam. Father, sorry, just the uh, since the issue really is very concerning a lot of people, just to, to clarify, like in, in general, if we eat in a, in a Christian owned restaurant versus an Asian owned restaurant, that would be okay. In general, we don't put it too much. Fem, fem, fem. We say that Allah has mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Al-Yawma, Muhilla Rakul. 
on this day, everything which is good and pure and fine is made possible to you. Sahih? And then Allah Azza wa Jalla, He mentioned about Ahlul Kitab, or Ahlul Yudhu Kitab. Yaani al Yahud wa Nasara, the Jews and the Christians. What did He say about their food? Mat'am wa Ladina? Huh? Ish? Hillul Lakum. The food of those who have been given the scripture is lawful for you. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the interpreter of the Quran, he said in Sahih Bukhari, Ya'ani, the Ba'i Hamun, Al Maqsud bin Ta'ar, place in the bed, with the stomach, with the fawakir, with the ma, Al Muhum. He says, What's meant by the food of those who have been given the scripture, their slaughtered meats. So we say step A. As many Muslims they have in step A is that the slaughter meat of a Jew or Christian is what? Halal. What the conditions that that meat or that animal was slaughtered upon what he believes to be correct. Upon what he believes to be sacred in his deed. Step one. Step two. If we don't know how the meat was slaughtered, we don't have any idea or any clue how the meat was slaughtered. Was it stabbed to death? Was it electrocuted? Was it drowned? Did they slam it on the ground? If we don't know, it is permissible for us to eat and it is not obligatory to ask. It is permissible to eat and it is not obligatory to ask. Whether they're real Christians, whether they're fake Christians, whether they're covered, whether they're uncovered. Al-Muhim, they are Nasama. They call themselves Christians, and they don't outwardly declare shit. We believe in one God. Is that God Allah, one of three? There's a lot of Son of God. I mean, we believe in what? One God. The Jew says he believes in what? One God. How did he slaughter it? We don't know. Laysa alayna in Nesham. Laysa alayna ish. And that's a tariq al khubu thalitha. In alimna. لأن هذه اللحوم إنما ذبحت على طريق قيد شرعية فإنها تحرم ولو كانت من اليهود والنصارى. If we know that those meats were slaughtered incorrectly, then it's impermissible to eat them, even if they're Jews and if they're Christians. The Muslims, inshallah, can agree on these two points. The khilaf comes in, should we ask? And what is a Jew and what is a Christian? We say once again, in America, most slaughterhouses, how do they kill the animals? Shot. Shotgun or electric, whatever the case may be. Most slaughterhouses, how do they kill them? Without a doubt. So therefore, we would say that the hustle of America is that it's slaughtered incorrectly. The hustle. Some scholars say that it's the opposite now. The hustle is no longer permissible. The hustle is now impermissible. Why is that? It's because it is untraditional for them to slaughter it correctly. It is what? Untraditional. It's inhumane. Savage. Unclean. They will shut down your slaughterhouse if a person comes with a knife and cuts every cow. Let alone mass production. McDonald's filled how many, how many people they serve a day? A billion. A billion people. It's a lot of meat. It's a lot of meat. Quick, fast mass production goes against the Islamic way of slaughter. There's no doubt about this. That's one view. One view states that Al-Asr fi hadi lahum a tahreem. Because the tariqa ma'rufa fi al-balad, khilaf al tariqa shari'iyya. And some scholars, they say, bend the laqs. Ma'dam indana asr, nabshi ala had al-asr. Hatta yatabayyana lana khilaf al asr. Mahma kanat al-guruf wal ahwal. They say, we have a principle from Allah. Allah said it's halal. We don't have to ask, it remains halal until we know yaqeen, until we see or hear that anna had dhubihat, that it's been slaughtered incorrectly. So these are the two conf conflicting views. The opinion that I see to be most correct in Allah, A'lam, the opinion that seems to be most correct in Allah knows best, is that the Muslim is not to eat from those restaurants and from those places. As for if it's an Asian restaurant or a Christian restaurant, then it's practically the same. Because there are many Asian restaurants who are Christians. Some of them are considered to be pagans, but they may get their meat from a general factory. And the factory is a quote unquote Christian factory or a Jewish factory. So at the end of the day, 
it's not like that. What the, that idol worship or that Buddhist or that Hindu is slaughtering the animal. Rather, he's getting it from mass production. Just as the Jew or the Christian gets it from mass production. So, Allah, well, the thing that seems to be most correct is that a Muslim should not eat from those places unless it's dire necessity. However, one last thing, brothers and sisters. If a Muslim does eat from those restaurants, you should not repudiate them and criticize them. You should not go on and censure them because they have proof. They have scholars who have taken that view, who have given that function. You can stay away from the meat. I don't feed it to my family. I think it's disgusting. I think it's haram. But I cannot force my view on another person. Madam, ulama al-sunnah, fuqaha al-sunnah, ikhtarifu fi al-masala. Then I talk about the nazila, masala nazila. Madam, ikhtarifu fi al-masala, fal-al-awami sa'ah, insha'Allah. Madam, khilaf mu'atabah. Lays al-khilaf insha'Allah. The khilaf is not a weak khilaf. It's not a strange khilaf. It's considerable difference. Then there's room for the general nine to five Muslim. We go out to eat. The brother wants to eat from McDonald's. La wa shukran. I eat a fish for that. He eats a Big Mac. I don't think that's okay. But if he has proof and evidence, if he has scholars who support him in that statement, I cannot necessarily say it's haram. You're going to hell. Well, then, the problem comes in that last thing when the Muslim forces his view on another Muslim. The Muslim does what? He forces his view on the next Muslim. That's where the mushkila comes in. When you force your view. If it's weak difference of opinion, then you can force your view. The khilaf is ba'if. Ah, this is incorrect. Bless you. But if the khilaf is more tabab, if it's considerable, then la ikala fi masail al-khilaf. As the ulama say, there's no criticism in issues of respectable difference of opinion. What hadith yatul is very, 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 very long technical issue. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is rasul of us. Tabab. The deer, you can't, you can't, you know, the deer, you can hunt, everything hunting, it's halal. Tayyip. But with the gun, the deer, and you give you the deer. Tayyip. Brother asked about hunting. We say that Allah Azza wa Jal and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have clearly allowed us to hunt in the Quran. Fasadu, Allah says. Fasad, hunt after you come out of Ihram. If I that halal to Fasad. Allah says when you're out of the Ihram state, then you can hunt. The Prophet clearly mentioned the rulings of hunting. Hunting is permissible. Hunting an animal is one of the instances or one of the exclusions or exceptions to the rule of slaughtering. You cannot cut the animal's throat, you cannot remove the windpipe, the esophagus. It's permissible to shoot with an arrow or with a bow, as the or a gun, as the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ma anhar dam wa dhukir asmalai alay khayr asinni wa dhufa." He says, "Anything that spills the blood of the animal, and Allah's name is mentioned thereupon, that's not a nail or bone." Ma anhar dam. This is an example of something which is general. Anything that spills the blood of the animal, a gunshot. An arrow, something that pierces the body, and it causes the blood to do what? Pour out. In that instance, you don't have to slaughter the animal. However, there are conditions of a person who hunts. You can only eat the hunted game of a person who is allowed to slaughter free. Meaning, if an atheist hunted an animal, can you eat the hunted game? We say no. He has to be a Jew or Christian. He has to be a what? Jew or a Christian. A Jew or Christian. The one, well, of course, if it, of course, the, most, the point that we're trying to make is that you can eat a hunting, you can eat the hunting game with the conditions of the slaughtered animal. With conditions of what? Of the slaughtered animal. And very important point: if you hunt an animal and you catch it before it dies, you just slaughter the animal. If it's still living, if it's still breathing, it's wounded, then you say Bismillah. You make the dua and you slaughter the animal. However, if you can't slaughter it, if you can only shoot it, and it runs away, and it bleeds to death, it is permissible to eat. And that's because it's a, it's a necessity, it's a need. The animal's fast, it's, it's a wild animal. It's not a domestic animal, it's not livestock. However, if a mushrik hunts that animal and he doesn't say Bismillah, can't eat it. If a person who's not a Muslim, a Jewish Christian, hunts that animal and he's not proper, then you can't eat the game. 
Clear? Shaba? Shaba. Thank you. No problem. Fabo. Yes, I change the subject on you on uh, question about Zakat al Mal. Tayyip. Um, 401k, the retirement. Tayyip. Um, are we allowed to pay the Zakat al Mal on the 401k through the year or we have to wait until we reach the age and get it all at some point? Tayyip, the question is. Paying Zakat on 401k. Do we have to pay it every year? Or can we or should we wait until the end of the 401k? We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to pay Zakat on our wealth. To pay the Zakat on our wealth. There's no difference of opinion about this. And we say that wealth is of two types. There's some type of wealth in which you must give as soon as you receive it, such as harvest. Allah says, give the haq when you reap the harvest. As for the other types of wealth, then you only have to pay the zakah when 12 Islamic months go by. Pay attention, 12 Islamic months, not the 12 lunar months. 12 Islamic months. When 12 Islamic months go by and you have a stack of money that is not from your necessities, your bills, then you must pay the zakat. However, what I can, what I can, some fuqaha mentioned it is permissible for a person to delay the payment of his zakat if it's a specific need or necessity. Whereas a person feels that hard times are coming difficult times are coming. It's going to be a major depression, a major recession, an economic fall. And the people are going to need this money. And some fuqaha mentioned it is permissible to delay the payment of your zakat with that stipulation. If that's not the case, then you have to give the zakat when the 12 Islamic months go by. A slave doesn't know when death will come to him. So therefore, I see in Allah's words of best is the Muslim should pay the zakat of the 401k or whatever amount of savings that he has that are not included in his daily eating and drinking, his electric bill, his gas bill, he's to pay the zakat after 12 Islamic months. 401k, other than 401k. If the money sits there, you should pay the zakat after 12 Islamic months. Wallah okay, um, you know, yeah, 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 I understand exactly. So, um, you know, the 401k goes up, up and down. How I calculate this? Like, you know, let's say you put dollar here and the dollar, the end of that 12 uh, Islamic month make three dollars. Should I get the, the zakah on the two dollar or on the whole three dollars? Clear. With regards to the rates going up and down, fluctuating, we say what's important is the end. It's what you have at the end of the 12 Islamic months. The total, without a doubt. And not the capital, or whatever you want to call it. Just as if you were to have livestock. If you had livestock, you start off with 40 sheep. 42 sheep. How many sheep do you have to give? How many? Lie, not 2.5% of sheep. Lie. That's only on currency. Gold and silver. You have 42 sheep. How many sheep do you have to give? One, five. You have 41 sheep for three months. However, after several months, the sheep, they make more sheep, they produce sheep. Now you have 75 sheep, 100 sheep. Do we still say you only pay zakat for one? Because that was the beginning? La. We say that zakat al farah, zakat al hasl, is that you give the, the, the total at the end. How much money you acquired at the end of the 12 Islamic months. Even if it goes down. Even if it goes down, you say al-ibrah bil akhir, the last sum that you have. However, it's always best to give more zakat. As I was mentioned, it is always best to give more zakat because very seldom does the believer have a job that is 101% permissible. Very seldom, especially in the times that we live in. Especially in the times that we live in. Especially in the times of it, very seldom we find a job that is 100% halal. Is this not the case? So therefore, a person should always give extra zakat to clean up, to clean up, 
Michelle, sure. thank you. Play. Follow. Uh, what is the correct way to slaughter an animal? The question the, is, what is the, the correct full, The full correct way. What is the full correct way to slaughter an animal? We say the conditions of slaughtering the animal, there are conditions of the one who's slaughtering, and there are conditions for how to slaughter and what is being slaughtered. As for the conditions of the one who's slaughtering, he has to be qualified to slaughter. He's a Muslim, a Jew, or a Christian. He must have he or her is permissible for women to slaughter the physical capability to slaughter. A person who's too weak, he takes the blade and he shakes, he's nervous, he can't cut it, it's impermissible for him to slaughter. And you can't eat because it's punishing the animal. He must be able to make one quick, swift stroke of the blade, Bismillah Allah, and the blood goes out. We say the thing that you slaughter with, it must be sharp, extremely sharp. It can be wooden, it can be stone, it can be glass, it can be metal. Al-Muhim and Nikuna Muhaddad. It has to be extremely sharp. It cannot be a bone, it cannot be a fang or anything like this. We also say is that a person must cut what is obligatory to be cut. He must cut at least three things, which are what, Mustafa? The windpipe and the, the jugular veins. They must be severed. Whereas the ruh, the soul, leaves the animal. These are the basic conditions of slaughtering. Is that you have those proper conditions, the person is eligible to slaughter, the person is of age, he understands what to do, and who he's slaughtering for. The knife is sharp, it's not a bone, it's not a fang. But if any animal is permissible to be slaughtered, you cannot slaughter a whole. Then be in the night as a judge, slaughter is permissible. We say that you make the dua, Bismillah. Allahumma uh, hafiz mika wa ilayka tukabbal minni. The dua of Uthiyah, oh Allah, this is from me to you, please accept from me. And this is the basic rules of slaughter. As for facing the animals of the tibla, making wudu on the animal, things like this, it's not that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Allah Azza wa Jalla. All that? Yeah, okay. One more. One more. One more. One more. So the way I look at it is when you're calculating your zakat, uh, that's for one k money is not for yours. The government is going to take a piece, and then you know the, the rest of it is actually yours. So you know I've read it on the internet, and I truly believe that okay, whatever is left over that you can withdraw today is what you should pay zakat. You should pay some of what's left over at the end. So, so let's say I have you know, ten dollars in my phone, okay? If I go to make a withdrawal today, the government's gonna take thirty percent of what's All of that is not about ten dollars. What's that? The ten dollars is not all mine. Exactly. So take thirty percent of the ten dollars and then pay the rest later. We say later when we say that this question, the 401k doesn't belong all to me. So how can I pay the capital? We say this is J good. However, it goes back to another issue, and that is, what is the ruling on pain zakat on a debt? What is the ruling on pain zakat on debt? Money that you owe. It's a difference of opinion. Some scholars say, even if all of it isn't yours, pay zakat on your percentage. And some scholars, they say, there is no zakat in la bimurkitam. Complete total ownership of the wealth. So if you go with this opinion, then you pay the zakat. If you go with the other opinion, then you wait until the money is all yours. Allah Azza wa Jalla. Clear? 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 Sorry, I got you. Sorry, I got into your video. I don't know. I have nothing to do with that. I don't know. 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 I don't Thank you once again, Jazakallah Khairan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen, Wa Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Wa Hamdik, Ashadu Wa Ta'ala. Let me sit in your place, please. So it's a one minute and one minute. So it's a one minute and one minute.